Hi, welcome to the first edition of the Conference Pule Brasil. Antes de começar, gostaríamos de lembrar ao nosso público que este painel está disponível em português em nosso canal no YouTube. My name is Camila Luz. I am a master's student in journalism and international relations, and I am part of the communication team at Conference Pule Brasil. On behalf of the organizing team, I would like to thank everyone for participating participating in our panel on gender equality. This conference is organized by students and alumni of Sciences Po Paris, and its central theme is Overcoming Inequalities, 10 Years to the Sustainable Development Goals. There will be 13 panels and more than 50 speakers distributed over seven weeks. In addition to the relentless and voluntary work of our team, we thank our partners, Chichisetubo Foundation, the Political Observatory of Latin America at Sciences Po, Educalibras, and Headline for allowing us to create a free online event with simultaneous interpreting into English, Portuguese, and Brazilian Sign Language. Before we start today's panel, I would like to take this opportunity to invite everyone to participate in our next session on November 28th at the 11 a.m. Brazil time, in which we will discuss structural racism in Brazil and in which we'll have the participation of Tiago Amparo, Diversity Coordination at FGV, and columnist at Folha de São Paulo, Gabriel de Carvalho Sampaio, lawyer and coordinator of the program for confronting institutional violence and strategic litigation at Connect Us Uma Human Rights, and Jurema Werneck, doctor and executive di director at Amnesty International Brazil, moderated by Barbara Pais, master in gender and development at the University of Sussex and co-founder of the MINAS program. I'd like to thank the panelists and moderators who voluntarily participated in the debate and made this event possible. I now give the floor to Maida Hubach, who will introduce the theme of today's panel and introduce our guests. Good afternoon and good evening to everyone. My name is Maida Hubach. I am a master in human rights with a gender focus by Sciences Po Paris. And first of all, I'd like to thank you for being here. And uh, it's a pleasure to moderate this debate. Uh, with such important women, I'm not going to extend much on this, but I would also like to thank the organizers of Conference Pour les Brasil for the invitation and the uh, trust. Um, I get very emotional because I know uh, how this all started and I could never imagine moderating a debate of such importance with people who have such relevant work on gender equality. It's impossible to debate inequalities in Brazil without approaching the gender issues. The, a, a gender pro approach must be present in all debates anyway. And tomorrow is November 25th. It's the day for the elimination of violence against women. And I believe this is a good time to debate about this and also considering the political context. 
Just to put everyone in this context, according to the IBGE, the life expectancy of the Brazilian population is 75.5 years, but this average drops to 35 years when we talk about transgender women. That is half of the national estimate. Over the past 10 years, Brazil has seen itself in the country in, with the highest rate of murders of trans people in the world. In 2019 alone, 124 murders of trans people happened. According to the 2017 IPEA data, 16% of all women murdered in Brazil were black. The data in Brazil is alarming regarding racism, transphobia, feminicides, political violence against women and domestic violence. And in the context of the pandemics, the cases of domestic violence and gender inequalities have increased even more in several countries. And of course, Brazil is no different. Without further ado, and because uh, the panelists will be able to speak of this much with much more property than myself, uh, I'm going to, to introduce uh, all of them to you now. Sueli Carneiro is a philosopher, a PhD in educator from uh, the Federal University of Sao Paulo, activist, founder and director of Portal Geledes, the Institute, Instituto da Mulher Negra. She has been doing essential work in our country to combat and fight racism against women and black people. In addition, she is one of the greatest exponents of black feminism in Brazil and the author of several works, among one of them, Uh, a book she has written on writing of a work that brings together various accounts of her struggle work. Next, we are going to have Bruna Benevides, who is the first trans woman in active service in the Brazilian Navy, feminist, trans activist, gender and diversity consultant, and currently secretary of the political articulation of the National Association of Travesties and Transsexuals. She's author of the annual survey, Dossiers on Murders and Violence Against Brazilian Travesties and Transsexuals. And it's from this research I bring you data from. Our third guest, Deborah Diniz, is an anthropologist and law professor at Federal University of Brasilia, founder of the organization Anis Instituto de Bioética, which does an incredible job of researching and defending human rights on topics such as sexual rights and reproductive rights, disabilities, mental health, violence against women, and penal and social education systems. She's also a researcher at the Center of the Latin American and Caribbean Studies at the Brown University, and earlier this year she received the Dan David Award. At this unusual moment of pandemics, she has also been dedicating herself writing memoirs on the, epi on the epidemics in Brazil, on the pandemics, and reporting women's stories. We'd like to remind our public that you can send uh, questions through any of the platforms we are broadcasting from. And with this first round, we are going to have our own questions here. So, Sueli, I'd like to take the advantage of this scenario of elections so that in your speech you can address the inequalities in which, uh, to which viol uh, black women are submitted to, and especially the political violence, considering uh, the case of Marielle Franco and some other lighter, let's say, to, uh, attacks that have been made through tweets to, uh, in reference to Talidia Peroni and Benedita da Silva. Thank you, Maida, for your great presentation. Thank you for the introduction. I thank you for this honorable invitation to be here next to these valuable women. And it's a pleasure to be with you, Bruna and Deborah. As Maida has mentioned, I am willing to approach the inequalities on gender and specific challenges the black women face in Brazil. When we talk about black women in Brazil, we talk about, as Maida said, we talk about, this is about feminism, chronic poverty, a lack of inclusion policies, being a black woman in Brazil means belonging to 
a signal of death and threat. In this context, the black life re is reduced to a dramatic preservation of the most elementary right of human, which is the right to life. Apart from the right to life, we uh, face violations on social, cultural context of the black population and blockage that prevents them from access to several aspects of uh, community living. And this is being faced by the Brazilian black br female community in Brazil these days. Black women have been responding, responding with fight, political manifestation at national level. They are acting in several different fronts. And by uh, the March of Black Women has been published and we demand for public policies that are made towards the black population. We demand that this is implemented and executed firmly. Strategy against racism, lesbophobia, considering the black population and we demand the participation through elective positions by means of social movements and right now this is being occupied by people who sacrifice their own personal goals in view of something more relevant and bigger for the community we have uh, claimed to the highest court of this country. It is a letter that has been written by women when we've sent it to the federal level. And in this letter, we highlight some of the actions that we've been implementing and the fight of black women against racism and sex. And this includes the signature of more than 54,000 women black women against racism and violence, they encompass the right to life of the population. And this is something that comes from government attitudes towards the black community. And also mention other forms of violence and uh, the delimitation of uh, Quilombo lands, implementation of the agreements that are national and have been signed by the Brazilian state in favor of the black community as a result of the platform of action of conference. We have claimed it to the higher court and civilizatory agents. They own the agenda of the, of the claiming for peace for most of the population in Brazil and the vast majority of the Brazilian population is black. There are preferential targets for racism transphobia and other sorts of discriminations they also have their own fight and this brings the subject of pluriracialism we reinforce our vigilance over the democrat democratic institutions so we call the judiciary to take their constitutional responsibility with the, pro with the protection of our lives and the demanding for our freedom. We keep on demanding for the identification of the crime that 
seized Marielle Franco's life, public policies that ensure life and not the extermination of the black population. Because for black women, the murder of the legislator Marielle Franco in 2018 was an attack that had to be responded in every way. We are with intermittent demands on who has who has ordered this murder and we want a response from Brazil. The murder of Marielle Franco has put a, a demand to a response that we sort of got during these latest elections with more expression of women, more women in the power, more black women in the power and more victories. And Roberta Eugenio, who was a parliament uh, assistant of Marielle Franco's until she was murdered, she has shown us there is some advancement of women and they have been representing themselves in policy, in, in politics in Brazil. In the election of 2016, only around 30% of the candidates were elected being women. And, and with this year of uncertainty in elections, the, the hardest sanitary crisis of our age, maybe we can turn this table and make the big change with nine capitals having candidates and ele uh, elected women. We now have women as some of the most voted during these listed elections. Now the victories will now add a few names that were unknown until then for the for the national politics as a result of the votes and the victories are still being counted this is a project of a city a political project that is fought for by these women that reinsured the historic agenda of the black women movement in the local politics. She also says we're talking about well, good life for black lives, even if we have to leave our own lives behind. She also mentions the changes that we see in the future, what Erica Hilton, the first recently elected trans black women, now are called to face this fascist wave that has spread throughout Brazil. I honor this new generation of black women, continuity and overcoming difficulties my generation had, and they're writing in history a positive destiny for uh, black women, even if that cost the, the quality of life for them. They are courageous women, but this freedom uh, spirit that motivates this black woman also uh, count on the progressive forces in Brazil and abroad, denunciations of uh, human rights violations for black populations in Brazil, especially uh, in our communities. Today, we started a campaign for national and international support for life for Ana Ma Lucia Martins, a municipal legislative representative that has been suffering threat, uh, threats to her life. They say now we don't only have to kill her and have her uh, substitute who's white in office. Since this historical election of Ana Lucia, hate measures have been excessive towards the legislature. So we count on you to help us pressure Brazilian authorities, especially in the state of Santa Catarina, so that the proper measures are taken to protect 
her life, uh, the life of Anousia Martins, from uh, racism, sexism, which are relentless in Brazilian society. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Sueli. I'll pass the floor now to Bruna. And surely the fact that we entered the, the theme of elections brings the other issues to mind, like transphobia, because we've seen many things related to that during election. But before that, Sueli, uh, got me thinking about inclusion policies. And in the beginning of this month, Minister Damaris launched an initiative to insert uh, transvestites in the job market. And she was questioned, and when she responded, she said that she had to do that because the law tells her to do so. I don't know why I, uh, the, this uh, answers from her still surprise me. But Bruna, if you can talk a little bit about that, contribute you with your experience, tell us how you see this initiative and what are the main challenges with this current government regarding trans people. The bodies of transvestite or transgender women have always been uh, tested from the moment we are marked as black, as transvestites or as uh, uh, gender different people. So they talked a lot about the political questions and we have a very low life estimate for trans people. And I've mentioned that in many spaces. We are a population who is, we are born dead already and we fight day, every day to generate life from this place of death we have been placed in because violence is often the first institution we have to face, especially gender violence, which is born caused by cis sexism, the idea that only the cisgender identities are valid. So it finds several tools to try to end the existence or the potentials in the forms of existing of our gender, especially as bodies that are not being thought of as legitimate, as real, as true, as capable of producing science or even affection. It's from this place that we talk and debate gender, not a cisgender gender, because that category doesn't uh, allows us to leave. It doesn't uh, pertain to us. It doesn't allow me to exist as a woman. So cis sexism has been using this uh, scarecrow, which is gender identity that if can be summarized is a process through which cis sexism uses to eliminate the existence of transgender people. So this pseudo facing of uh, gender ideology can be summarized as an agenda, uh, anti-trans global agenda with alliance of conservative areas, but also unfortunately some feminist sectors that have been defending some of the sectors that are always putting our lives at risk. So in a place in, in the country that kills more people, uh, trans people in the world, these are real data that, and that uh, from an institution that analyzes the real data from our country and produce this data related to our death uh, because of this uh, epidemics of uh, violence against us, especially because of the omission and denial of this government against these bodies, uh, these existences. Brazil created a project of precarity for the existence of trans people, especially transvestites and uh, trans black women. This comes from our de the dictatorship when we were hunted and killed, especially when we think we can exist uh, when we think 
when we started thinking we could exist as political beings, we started being hunted by the, this government, trying to cleanse these bodies that are not even seen as people. We trans women still fight for the, the right to humanize our identities, to our non-acceptance of compulsive cisgender uh, agendas. So because of that, we see have so many difficulties in debating this matter without uh, prejudice, in a sense that we could capture our my speech uh, studied by other people who are taking over my uh, speech and uh, detriment to my existence. So we need to analyze this whole, this whole narrative that created an archetype of what would a uh, trans person would be in this place. This myth of violent transvestites that are uh, have always been dehumanized, so we can advance in this process of conquering some rights despite all this adverse scenario we face. So transphobia, talking about the candidates in this election, it comes a lot from, for example, we don't have investment from the parties and candidates that already started from a very disadvantageous place. In 2020, we had many candidates where the uh, trans candidates didn't even have the money for uh, transportation to do work on their campaigns. Despite that, we have been facing violence, transphobia, the killing of our population, sexism, and our, uh, the killing of our objective and have progressed in this political area. But we're fighting for our bodies and we have elected 31 trans people. This is the most recent data that has been cataloged by me through ANTRA. Not even TSA, the, the uh, electoral Supreme Court was able to say, tell us how many trans uh, candidates have been elected. There are limited data on how many we are. We still don't know how many we are in Brazil. So it's a very uh, violent task to find out how many of us are killed every day, how many of us are killed every year. And we can find that out, but we don't know how many we are as a population, so we can have access to public policies. So we have, uh, this government has elected sexism, uh, male chauvinism, racism as the way to debate with anybody who doesn't follow their own agenda, this religious agenda that re constantly interferes on the a state where they try to maintain a body that is heterosexual, a, an heterosexual family that excludes any other possibilities. So we still see in this process a Brazilian government as one of the main violators of our existence, especially when recently we have uh, in a meeting with the Mercosur, uh, the Brazilian government denied to participate using the body of a transvestite, saying that they would not accept the mention of gender identity uh, gender expression, expressing a hate that unfortunately we have to face every single day. So we need spaces like this one where we have three women, where we have a diversity of women debating so we can go move on creating safe spaces for the, the, the debates so we can talk without any kind of taboos or myths regarding our existence. We are not uh, against women's fights, although we have specific agendas at some points, they are not synonyms of exclusion. On the contrary, we've always, women have always carried this 
state, all these structures on our back. And women are the ones who are going to bring and are bringing change, especially with regards to the reference as to, to trans women who have always put themselves in this fight and saying no to all this violence. And because of this process, we are committed to fight for a government that is not related to religions, to fight for democracy so we can debate sexual reproductive life uh, without uh, considering myths and taboos and considering how kids are generated, especially for trans kids who have no protection from the state. Nowadays, we have a very huge number of people in our country who survive using only with prostitution. And they use solutions that have at no moment face it, face the problems of cis sexism, transphobia, and other difficulties our population has to face every day. So it is in this scenario that we have to be ever more attentive. If you want to find out what problems and violences trans people have to face, listen to trans people. Have theory as a reference, but go on to the field, because I'm sure that this body, even in face of a scenario of death that was put uh, in their faces, they're fighting to build a reality that will welcome everybody. So whatever you have a transvesti or a trans black woman, you will have somebody fighting and we have a lot to contribute for the fight of every woman and fighting against all kinds of violence. Thank you very much. I thank you very much for this contribution. We know there is a lot of work to do and I can speak on behalf of all of you because the result of the elections was a way we could uh, deeply and see some change. Now I will give the floor to Deborah now. This morning I saw uh, uh, a comic strip from TPM magazine from the new abnormal in which they said how many brilliant artists ceased to exist because they had to look after the house. And I'd like to know what you think of the, the economy of care. With the pandemics, this burden of, of physical and mental work has increased for women, and this has increased the gender inequality in the country. Thank you very much, Maida. Thank you very much to all of you for the invitation and for being here with Professor Sueli Carneiro and also with Bruna Benevides. And a place of a huge honor and now trying to answer your question on the economy of care. I would like to start by answering one or asking you one question. What has the pandemics done to you, to our bodies? This uh, has taken the bodies from the streets and locked them in their houses. We hope the pandemic had done that so that people could follow science and have conditions to take care of themselves and of their relationships. The abstraction of norms of public health for the reduction of illness comes from an abstract subject with working conditions within the home. It's different from domestic work that is remunerated or not. The dependency relationships, something private in which the precarious informal work was taken as a misfortune in life. To some people, it's something abstract. It's, there's no gender when we talk about pandemics and solutions. There is no difference when we mention the pandemics. Isn't that so? And we've always known. And it's not uh, specially directed to the black women in Brazil. The data I'm going to work with, they come from the census. They are unable to capture all the specificities 
you've mentioned, which are the specificities of uh, vulnerability layers we see. So for now, I apologize for the limitation of what we ask the world about, but this is proof of the limit of what we can access to answer the question. So the public space, it should be available to all of you, or all of them included in essential work, people who work and care of formality, formality, people's food and others. For those who are having formal precarious work, this doesn't, hasn't happened. And nothing such as working from home has existed for them. This would mean uh, impoverishment. Considering a response to the pandemics and numbers, we need to consider of the economy of care. We have to imagine black women moving a parallel survival economy from their very existence. It is essential at the pharmacy, at the taking care of uh, children and elderly, it's in, in food fairs and food production. I will give you populational data or what concrete women do live and how they have impoverished with the pandemic to answer your question. Considering the, the 2010 census, in one decade, Brazil has changed their regimes, people have changed their, uh, how they classify their own bodies. This is what we have available as data. So consider this with the proper care because the layers have not been considered. And this is what rules the public policies in Brazil. So considering the census of 2010, one out of four Brazilian women are black. It's similar to what we have as, as white people, women. You think of white women and you think of black women. Dona Pinheiro from IPEA said that we, we were concerned on understanding who these women are. Who are these women who are surviving anonymously? This is the women who move the economy of care. As said, as Bruna said, cis women is what the census can capture. There is a limit to the data. So we concentrated on women who are in reproductive ages from 16 on these are the ones who have more chances who are um, that these women are under a dependent relationship of care with people with disabilities people who probably are at their own home in a care relationship this was classified as an, is an essential work and we wanted to cross data from essential care to the economy of care. There is no human life with the dependence of care. We need to think beyond what we've been colonized to think. So the operators of health, when we talk about them, we think of the doctors and we think of the nurses. We need to understand that those who clean the floors at hospitals are also part of this. So I do not ignore those who wear that white jacket. They are response to pandemics, but there are other invisible workers. Um, so we look for social assistance works, cleaning of, of health care, store clerks, caretakers. We classified them as essential. People had to keep themselves working during the pandemics to take care of survival of those who were affected. And then when we look at this like this, things change. If one out of four are black and one out of four are white, we need to think of care in a different perspective. The Brazilian population in the economy of care have uh, found specific descriptions. The economy of care started becoming feminine Essentially, three out of four caretakers are women. Three out of four who are in the care industry are women. And women are twice as much workers of that economy than white. The provision of precarity is the rationalized gender. Why do we say that? Because if you consider the whole population in reproductive age, 
in the industry of care of per capita uh, wages of half a minimum salary, there is only one person in the house earning half of one minimum salary. We have twice as much black women in the situation than white. And it's just so hard to understand, but who is in the care economy under precarious with conditions with no protection and people are surviving on this sort of work it's the black woman the poor woman that is the basis of the economy of care in brazil i knew that before maybe our efforts would be to dig into what is available in the census just to prove the data that we receive, but we need to work on this data to show where inequality is. So, so one, if Luana Pinheiro and I are right with this rationale on this, I will now answer about the question on the pandemics and the impact on the pandemics, because this is the question that we are being asked. If this is essential work and this moves from people from their houses to, to the street, this is there is one concentration of black women if this is it what is the impact of the economy of care well it has a gender and it has a race what is the impact of this economy to the pandemics it impacts then black women so the dichotomy that has been imposed of saving two people and saving the economy it surpasses the economy of care the black women are the one who take cares take care of who are suffering with the pandemic. They are under risk. Those are the ones with no social protection that are emergence, emergent in this context and they are impoverishing. And just the same as domestic work. What is the impact of this fragilization of the economy protection and the economy of care for gender equality and racial equality? Apart from the impoverishment, there are dramatic risks to women who are under reproductive ages. The known prioritization of collective health as a collective, as a pandemic response. UFPA has disclosed a report considering the lack of inputs and the lack of care with the health system and to the COVID victims, just like the US government, like the Brazilian government, this will lead to a, a dramatic future for such women who are included in the economy of care. As the variations of poverty levels are predictors of the floating of access to contraceptive medication. The problem of black women in particular will impact the reproductive situation for them at a long term. In Argentina, things are different. So understanding the pregnancy in of adolescents, mortality. This is the impact that we can expect away and right after COVID. We've already lived the impact of COVID-19, but, but if you think of a woman, a woman that is pregnant and then has the baby and then goes under their poor period and they have COVID, they are going to die much more often and this is data that is beyond any data from any other country in the world. So there is no response of this sort if we do not separate all this data and understand gender and race within this data. Because data have not allowed me to bring any other markers or, or consider any other sexuality aspects. These are bodies that are previously marked due to precarization G regimes that are in placed in life. We have not learned with the Zika virus epidemic uh, pandemics. And we are now living Two, two sanitary emergencies within five years in Brazil. There is no 
response to uh, sanitary emergency that can improve anything for the women who are in the care economy. In, case, in this case, the black women have to be the center of this response. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah. I don't know if we will be able to analyze any of the speeches in a happier approach, but I would like to start answering the questions from the audience. I have questions for all of you, but I'd like to ask specifically Bruna, a question from Gabriela Lima. The fight against transphobia, does he have to start within the House of Deputies or from society? Where does it have to start? How can we change the murder curve? In fact, the fight against transphobia has to be part of the day-to-day -day life. We are a country that is pretty much advanced in the conquer of rights, which is the result of social movements, but at the same time, we are deficient when we don't have guarantees at social level so that the population can access this. So the, the daily routine is of, is of urgent need. They play, uh, the social aspect of it plays an important role and especially with education, we need to insist on the importance of a sexual education for diversity at schools and most and uh, very urgently at the closest levels possible so that we can generate the idea that diversity exists and this has to be celebrated and this is not and we are not result of an ideology we do exist we coexist in several different ways in society but uh, we need this visibility but this is uh, we need this visibility not to put us as risk, at risk, but we need the cooperation from every level of society so that the transphobia is fought against in, at all levels of society. I think it's a broad answer, but I think this is, uh, it's hard to say what to do, because especially within the institutions that have generated the transphobia, transphobia uh, the racism uh, is a result of the cis uh, people but the cis people need to commit to stop violating our bodies and ensuring our safety, first of all. Thank you for your answer. Next question, I think applies to everybody. It's not to a specific person. It comes from Tomás de Barros. And it is, it says, the defense of the many feminist fights leads the right wing to incorporate some of this uh, agenda. How do you deal with this agenda when even they take a little bit of the radical aspects of it? Would you like to start, Sully? I have a very quick answer for that. The experience we are having in Brazil doesn't authorize us to say that the right wing is taking over this feminist agenda. On the contrary, what we see is an extreme right wing and the government with neo-fascist fascist, uh, expression that healed all the progressive agenda, saying that they invented uh, the gender ideology such as a supposed uh, ideology that should be fought in all dimensions of society, especially in schools. They have a, a, a we have a stream uh, right that causes genocide of the black population and uh, expressly denied the existence of racism in our society. So I don't see this happening in Brazil. On the contrary, I have a negation that is manifesting all agendas that are progressive and in all aspects that we see. In all the 40 years uh, I've seen 
everything I've seen regarding Brazilian democracy, I don't see that happening in Brazil. And I don't think that's possible. I don't think the right wing uh, is able to do this kind of thing, even if when they are not extreme right. Uh, it might be possible, but I don't see it. So, David, I'll pass the word to you if you want to compliment uh, Sweetie's answer. I have nothing to compliment. I can't even imagine this hypothesis of uh, right wing uh, defending feminism. So, I, I, I'll vote with the speaker here. So, Bruna, can, do you think you can help us there, there if you can compliment? Uh, if not, well, in fact, it is impossible to think of a right wing that will defend a uh, feminist, anti-racist uh, agenda. What we've seen is a dirty game of people who are trying to cover uh, their racism and transphobia and sexism, uh, saying that I can't be racist because I have a black friend. This is exactly the way they try to make it seem that they are defending uh, racism because you have the bodies of black women body who are LGBTQ, who are uh, always uh, put into second place, pressured and, and uh, try to control uh, thoughtless of by this right wing. It's um, uh, it's impossible to think that me, a, a trans woman that comes from the northeast of the country, would have any kind of expression or importance for this government. So it's, it, that's uh, basically what I can say, kind of only agreeing to what my friends have said. Uh, Donna, uh, Deborah is always, we're always uh, uh, supporting what our friends have said here. So, Bruna, I have a last question for you before we go into our final consideration. So, Alessandra Ramos asks, how can we insist with the Brazilian government to catalog and aggregate data on the killing of uh, trans women and feminist women as a whole? I believe, and I bring this in our research, I will recommend that all of you read that this is a serious job done without any kind of support. Uh, we've done it the way we can, but in a very precarious way. I think sub-notification is another policy of this government. When they don't recognize the specific violence we are subject to. For example, Maria da Penha law was not something that is so nice that this government created with the idea of protecting women against domestic violence. Brazil was made to uh, obligated to create uh, this law. So that can tell you how much this government that denies violence against women, denies racism, tries to suppress the data regarding violence against trans people, uh, against LGBTQ people. And they don't recognize uh, since they, they don't recognize this violence, they will not take any measures to uh, end that. And this perpetuates this high level of violence. And what we're doing with this assessing uh, and all this data is to try to pressure the federal and state governments and tell them how uh, they have uh, not done their job for example, in the state of Sao Paulo, we had 21 killings, homicides of trans people in the state of Sao Paulo, and the official data don't show any killing. So what they're saying is this population is a population we don't recognize, we don't have data, we don't have to debate that. We don't have to debate political uh, policies for these people, but while they don't have the data or the policies, we'll continue to fight with our colleagues, with other institutions, managing to try to, to get some kind of positive sentence and use that sentence to create a law so that our Supreme Court will 
assess data and work on the violence against the LGBTQ population and the trans victims that today we already have 155 homicides in Brazil. In the United States, for example, you have 28 P uh, homicides only. So our index is extremely higher than the United States. Our population as a whole is not that smaller than the United States, but you see how the proportion of the rate of homicide, homicides against us is extremely bigger. So thank you very much, Bruno. I said that this was going to be the last question, but we got another interesting question. I don't know what you think about that, but the question is, what's the role of men, white people, is cisgender people in fighting uh, chauvinism? Since I started with Sueli, I'll start with you again now. Okay, look, I'm going to use a phrase that I repeat ad infinitum because it expresses a deep belief I have. It's an African-American author, Charles Mills, and he, used, he says that there is a, so, uh, a racial contract in effect in, in the world that defined white supremacy. This contract says that all white people are benefited, benefit from racism, regardless of their will. And although they benefit from racism and gain all the privileges that it brings, uh, not everybody who's white has signed this sinister racial contract. So I have what I have there is the possibility of alliances and partnerships ships that we we'll like together. So you have white and black men and women, and I think that uh, this applies to men who are able to betray chauvinism and work on this on, and on the way they face the relationship between men and women. So I believe that having that as a black uh, scenario, I will try to find all men who do not uh, sign up to chauvinism. So I, all white people who don't, who don't believe in racism, yeah, I believe they exist and I believe we are capable together, black, white, and anti-racist people, men and, and women, anti-chauvinism. We, we can win over patriarchy and uh, create a new kind of society with new, possibilities for a civilization that will uh, bring down all this hierarchy that was created based on this ideology. And I have to believe that so I can keep on fighting. Thank you. Deborah, if you want to contribute with this question also. I'm sorry, I'm having to do this all the time because I don't see you here, sorry. I want to follow what Sueli said. I don't want to sign up to this contract. A racist uh, contract, it's a cis contract, uh, it's a cis feminist contract that uh, works on capacitism and I could, keep on talking and talking. I don't want to be a white woman that signs up to this contract. But being a white woman that has that benefits from this contract, I would say, what would be my duty when I say I am someone who doesn't want to sign up to this contract? What do I have to do? I have to unlearn. I have to identify the privileges that this whiteness brought me, what it made of me. It has to hurt and only me and all those who are white 
can do that. So we can start a pedagogy that is intense and permanent to unlearn the privileges of this whiteness. So not wanting to sign this contract is not enough. It demands from me some actions, a deliberate, permanent and insistent action that in the sense of transforming, instead of just saying, I can be part of this transformation, I need to demonstrate my support to this transformation. This is a, a long-term process in which I'll have to learn a lot of things, and it has to hurt. There's no way around it. That's it. Thank you, Deborah Bruna. Just complimenting, I'm very happy with the answers, but I want to ask that you can go further, going beyond that black uh, picture of Black Lives Matter, the, the uh, flag for the trans movement. But what we would like, what we, I think is that for all those who enjoy the benefits of all this structure that we know happens, they help push it back and ensure that other people can realize their potential. So ask yourselves, what am I doing since I'm privileged? I'm not saying, when I say privilege, I'm not saying there's no pain. A white woman that has privilege, I'm not saying she doesn't suffer with chauvinism. Privilege that has nothing to do with feeling. It has to do with access to. So what the, does the things you have access to can do for those who are not privileged? What can you do as a doctor, as a researcher, as a dentist, as someone who hires domestic server, uh, services? What can you do and what are you effectively doing? So that means creating an alliance with people who are already there, people who don't sign up to all these kinds of privileges and make your actions cause people to have access to other things. Maybe you will get the example of me, I'm a woman who is a transvestite, uh, but who has got much further than many people in my population have all, have gone. And this is a daily activity for all of us, even me. So we should bring this reflection. What can I do today to change the life of a black person, a, wo a black woman, a transvesti? And you will find your answers in your privilege. Thank you, Bruna. When I said at the beginning, I was happy to take part of this debate was because of this. I knew you could have incredible contributions to our conversation. And because of the time, we need to get on with the final consideration, so I'll give you the floor. But before this, ourselves as the conference, we'd like to encourage the public to study and dive very deep into all the questions we've approached. We would like to know whether you have a tip on any book or documentary that may have inspired you and you could share it with us. I know this question is to you, but myself in particular, there is a book I'd like to indicate. It's the last one, Conceição Evaristo. I don't know if everyone, a Tears of a Woman, Lágrimas de uma Mulher. It's a short story book, but it addresses what unites us as, especially as black women, so it's worthwhile. Swilly, if you'd like to uh, start with your considerations and any indications. Well, I want to reinforce my uh, thank you for being part of this event. It was a pleasure to be with Deborah and Bruna once again. And thank you for being able to produce speeches that potentialize us all. So thank you very much. And I thank you for being able to listen to each of you today with the, with the issues that have been the object of our fight. 
you know, of my activism and my my struggle. All of the data that have been presented in this panel show a scenario of inequality in which race and gender present themselves with structural characteristics. But what do we get with it? These numbers show, above all, that there is a racial conflict in Brazil. It's a place where a black young person is killed every 20 minutes. And feminicide uh, numbers are greater with black women. Uh, whereas with white women, these uh, numbers are decreasing consistently. Black women die of uh, evitable and preventable uh, causes. We need to bring these lessons up beyond the COVID-19. And black women are more vulnerable, as Deborah has mentioned, in this COVID scenario. Not and not even in the uh, African apartheid, we have been able to see such violence as the one and in the same proportion we see in Brazil. And mortality of black young people produces more victims than the armed conflict in the world. So what do I mean by this? The international attention is uh, directed towards the reality of black Brazilians. And just the same way it happened to South Africa, the invisibility we suffer cannot continue to hide the severity of the racism in Brazil. So we count on you. Thank you. Deborah, if you'd like to make your final considerations. Yes, I was here trying to look for my book. This is the book I indicate, a book written by Sueli Carneiro, Escritos de uma Vida. So I suggest this chapter at the beginning, Gender and Race in Brazilian Society. This is my contribution for those who are here with us today. And you need us uh, i need your special words on on my pages here okay thank you my dear thank you Sully, so, just to say something here i came here uh, with no library i brought just about 15 books with me if this means something to you this is one of the books i brought with me Okay, I'll consider everything you've mentioned, and I'm going to send you one, another one. And Compania das Letras, the publisher, they have just published it. And uh, I'll do my best to send it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. I hope my sister is listening to this panel, and I hope she has written, and I told her, at the very beginning that I wanted her book for Christmas. So as a side note here, my sister, Bruna, I will give you the floor. I have one question and we were talking about books. Do you have any indication of any book that uh, approaches the, the situation of transgender uh, children who still do not have a production of this sort? To, uh, children that are trans and travesties have always existed. It's difficult to say uh, anything about. Sofia Favero, her research is something that is worth uh, reading. Just some final considerations. It is very important that everyone listens to what we are saying, not on to assimilate this knowledge for themselves, but also to understand that this is a collective fight that depends on each and every person who is listening um, and 
you can use everything we've said and all the things that we haven't managed to bring to you to this uh, debate. There is a, a movie called A Corrente do Bem that, uh, that addresses the idea of passing messages along. It, uh, the the trans, uh, trans heritage is not always taught, but this is at the same time taught uh, people to put their voices ahead. So my recommendation would be pedagogy of the disobediency. Travestilizing is from Tiffany Odara, a black travesty from Bahia. And also the work that we've been carrying out and this yearly research on violence that uh, is used to for the to global ranking. This is not just numbers. This is not about talking about Dandara who has been murdered and etc. But it's a, a full anthropological analysis that is very well applied, and uh, they they explain what the numbers reveal so that we understand the effective ways of fighting, and uh, we cannot give our lives and our safety to the state the way they have been doing things we will we are not safe to go for the state for help so i'd like to say hello to ale alessandra ramos a great activist from uh ashe institute and i hope you can follow uh travesties and trans women and very important scientific production these uh, trans women have been making it's a society that does not compactuate with any facism, facism and any other sort of facism, facism that is in our daily routine that keep on affecting our society and our possibility of socializing with no form of higher accusation. So this is it. Thank you very much. I've written this down. Thank you for your indications and considerations. And once again, I thank you all for the participation. It was an excellent debate. And this is it. Thank you. Thank you, Sueli. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you to the translators and to everyone who were here. I know, and all the technicians. Thank you very much. And I'll see you soon. And thank you for the Brazilian Sign Language interpreters as well. Bye-bye.